there, there's a range of given heights. The six two is probably one of the generally accepted ones. So, which is to say, people, you know, they tend to uh, raise the height a little bit because why not? <laughs> yeah, there's a social construct that the taller you are, the more powerful you are. So to to add that kind of layer of not real to people in the past. So we won't go there. That's a different class. <laughs> By the definition, I should say I'm six feet. So. Okay, so Milo just told me you can't see me. Oh, I'm sorry, Milo. I'm gonna we're stop good. screen sharing but for a minute. Scott says we're good, so I think we're ready to go. Okay, so yes, let's get started. Me. I'm gonna give you guys, I will demote you, and I'm gonna give you guys one view of who we were talking about before we get started. Okay, um, do this. Okay, now you see me, I'm in Signers Hall. So let's get officially started and I will give you a view of the president of the convention. So I'm gonna officially record this session so you all have it for future use and anybody else who needs it. And we are officially live streaming. So hi, welcome to Signers Hall. This is a amazing room at the National Constitution Center and my name is Curry Faulkner. We are kicking off Constitution Week and I am here with Nick Moskowitz who is our top scholar of the day to teach this lesson. We thought it would be really fun if we had a topic of the Constitutional Convention to bring you into the room where it happened. This room, and we'll look at it throughout the program, is a recreation of the moment of the signing of the United States Constitution with many of the men formed into statutes who signed the Constitution and three men who refused to sign the Constitution. And we'll find out why in a minute from Nick. But before I do that, I was showing everybody earlier this little sneak peek of this guy right here. So this guy is 6264, we were debating, and he's the president of the convention at the time. Um, so any guesses in the chat box who's the big guy behind me? Any guesses? Open up that chat box. Feel free to put in some answers. Oh, Milo, Thomas Jefferson's such a good guess, but it's not Thomas Jefferson. Yes, very good. Okay, then I think that was Caitlin or We're, Catherine. Uh, sorry. Jefferson was in very France. Good. He was in Paris okay. during the convention. Yeah, I was going to say, Nick, tell us where Thomas Jefferson is. And Milo, that is the number one question we get here at the National Constitution Center. People walk into this room and they say, wait, where's Jefferson? And he's in France at the time. But George Washington is the guy right behind me. So let's get into the Constitutional Convention. As we go through the room and we go through the presentation today, I'm gonna to be jumping back and forth from PowerPoint to the statues in this room. Cause I thought it would just be a little more fun to get to see the inside of the museum when we have this awesome talk with Nick today. So Nick, are you ready to get started? Yeah, do you wanna, do you wanna talk about Washington at all or you just wanna go from there? Well, we, can, we can add him in as we go through. What I want to talk about. You can say today. why he was president. <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why, why don't you tell us why is he yeah. president of this convention? I, I just think it's worth noting from when we get started because he's a central figure. And the thing about Washington is during the convention, he doesn't really speak. He's not really amongst the debaters who is uh, figuring out the, the, the specific text and all the crucial debates that we're going to talk about. But he's a really important figure and Washington had to be convinced to be there. Uh, in 1783, he had retired um, from the army. He had relinquished his position as general in chief and retired to private life. Um, and he did not think he was coming back. Um, so he had to be convinced. Uh, we'll, we'll get into Shays' rebellion a little bit and how that played a factor in the constitutional convention. But James Madison himself, um, uh, played a central role in convincing Washington uh, that his presence was needed to keep everybody there and um, to really facilitate the convention working, right? He was a figure that helped uh, when a lot of people, frankly, were ready to leave at times, right? They needed moderating influences in Washington because he cared so much about the country and the union was that influence. Okay, that's awesome, Nick. Thank you for giving us that framing of kind of the weight that he brings and the importance of the convention. 
So I want you to go through these big, three big kind of topics today, but also give us like the facts. Like when was the convention? How long were they there? All that. And like how smelly the convention was, all that fun stuff. Um, so here's the big questions of today's class. Why did the founding generation decide to write a constitution? How, like, why did they get to that point? How did the United States Constitution differ from the Articles of Confederation? And what the heck are the Articles of Confederation? And then the third one, what were some of the main compromises reached by the delegates at the Constitutional Convention? And we can absolutely talk about slavery and how ensla enslaving people was a part of the Constitution and that compromise. We're gonna save that to the end, so we'll make sure we have a lot of time for those questions as well. So if you guys can see my screen and you see multiple screens, I'm actually standing beside Madison here because Nick referenced him and I'll try to do that as we go through. But Nick, let's kick this off. Let's talk about the what, where, and how, and when of the Constitutional Convention. Yeah, so the Constitutional Convention starts in May of 1787, and is Constitution Day is the celebration of the signing of the of the Constitution. It ends on September 17th, 1787. So we're talking about roughly uh, about four and a half months on a very particularly hot. Um, Philadelphia summer, as Curry mentioned, because of course uh, there wasn't air conditioning in 1787. So, uh, and they didn't want to open the windows too much because it was a secret convention. We'll get to that a little bit. Um, but they didn't want people listening in and knowing what it is that they were talking about inside Independence Hall. So it, uh, it could get not only hot, but then therefore uh, those debates could get particularly intense. So that gives us the, the timing. Um, and so why have a constitutional convention? Well, that actually ties into that second question, right? You said, what are the Articles of Confederation? Well, the Artic Articles of Confederation are important. They're the first constitution, um, right? So the Declaration of Independence, that's 1776. After the Declaration, uh, states begin writing their own constitutions, which are passed many of them that year and the next year. Uh, so the, the first real new constitutions are actually written by the states. The Articles is drafted in 1777, although it's not actually ratified until 1781. So the Articles is the first constitution that the Continental Congress is operating under during the Revolutionary War and then uh, thereafter. And the significance of it is it left a lot of power to the state. There wasn't a lot of power for the central government to do a number of things that turned out to be pretty important for the war, mainly to tax states and individuals and to do things like raising an army, right? They had to rely on the states to provide quotas of soldiers and to really figure it out for themselves. Unsurprisingly, for someone like George Washington and one of his main underlings, uh, Alexander Hamilton, they found that system very frustrating. Um, and it was hard to pay their soldiers when Congress couldn't tax anyone and Congress was perpetually broke. So there were problems during the war. And then thereafter, new problems arose, right? One of them is the war debt, which is increasingly a problem because it becomes a state issue and states aren't sure how to deal with it um, and how to pay these soldiers and how to deal with these war bonds that are, are very undervalued. There's a lot of speculation in the 1780s. The other thing is that people want to expand. They want new states, new territories. They want to go out west. Without a strong national government, um, they are unable to get the treaties and the guarantees necessary to be able to do that, uh, to even have a frontier army that, for instance, could protect people who are expanding out west where Native Americans were resisting. Um, and so those, some of those issues are the major ones that are also framing this rising uh, frustration with the Articles of Confederation that brings us to 1787. Okay, so recap real quick. We're, our country during the revolution and after the revolution is living under the Articles of Confederation. One of my favorite professors once told me, it was kind of like, he's like, it's like a loose league of friendship. Like, it's just kind of like a bunch of states being friendly, not like what we think about us, the United States today, that we're all just in it together to win the war, but we're really not fully together, which makes sense why the power would go back to the states. So we start with the Articles of Confederation. We get through the Revolutionary War. You talked about debt 
and raising armies. So I got to stand beside Alexander Hamilton here. And I know some of our students online today love Alexander Hamilton and have probably seen the musical about a million times. If you haven't, it's definitely really cool. Definitely get it, check it out. So what, how bad was it, Nick? So how bad was it with debt, talking about Hamilton, but how bad was it in our country living under these articles that weren't really working? The federal government didn't have the power to pay the soldiers. The federal government didn't have the power to help our country grow, all these things. So really like lay it down. Cause I feel like this is a truth we don't get told in school is how much we, how close we came to after the revolutionary war, almost losing everything. Yeah, I mean, uh... Just to throw out the terms before we start, I mean, think of it this way, right? Is League of Friendship or Compact, a C word, Compact or a Confederation, right? Um, there's a central government, but really the states are on their own. That's the difference between that and that term I used at the beginning, union. That's the term that Washington used, right? Union meaning that the actual larger central government, the one over all of us, is actually the larger, more important one, right? That's the difference, right? So that's kind of a crucial place to start, right? Is those terms actually matter. Um, so under the articles, there's there's a lot of problems, right? Um, having this war, this crisis of the war bonds, not being able to pay soldiers, and I mentioned speculation. Well, a lot of elite people, um, including Britain, right? Think about this way. The country we fought for independence, a lot of the richest people in that country were buying war bonds on the cheap in order to speculate that when they got paid off, they would make a lot of money off of Americans, right? That was the situation. We were basically in financial crisis in the 1780s. Because the articles didn't give Congress really a lot of power to do anything about it, states were making their own policies and they were making rival policies. That's important too, right? So New York, for instance, um, was freely taxing and denying free trade with smaller states like Connecticut, right? New Jersey did this too. And um, so small states were very upset because it was harming their economies and their ability to deal with the debt problem. Um, that's one issue, right? Also, it's impossible to change the articles because it required unanimous consent of all, all 13 states in order to pass an amendment. And they actually pa almost passed one for taxes, but one state said no, that was enough, right? Um, so you can just think of all these issues that are popping up and the frustration is the continual inability to do anything. And I mentioned uh, the West and even there, Jefferson was actually in Congress for a period of time, briefly. And he came up with an idea for settling the rest that eventually became known as the Northwest Ordinance um, and used his language, but it was changed a couple years later. The idea there was to you know, establish an agency and establish the purposes and means of settling new territories and states. Um, but even that was difficult to pass. And the reason we'll get into it is that Jefferson wanted to outlaw slavery in the territories. That will be an issue going forward. We'll talk about that at the end. Um, but again, it's frustration, right? That's the theme I'm bringing out here. So there's a political calculus behind the Constitution in the sense that for a lot of these leaders like Washington and Hamilton and others, um, they were frustrated during the war. They're even more frustrated after, and they're convinced that the only way to stay together and to have prosperity is to have a stronger central government. So one of the things that I know our students are studying, Nick, so that, that frustration gets huge. It's huge because we can't grow. It's huge because we can't work together. It's huge because of other countries are still knocking at our door to take us back over, even though we've won the revolution. And we can talk for a second about what France is doing right now. But I oh, know British, a lot of our- British first, British first. The British oh, no, don't I even just... leave their forts. So they signed the Treaty of Paris in 1783, but they don't take America seriously and they don't even follow their own treaty obligations. They don't leave their forts in the West. They leave soldiers there. And so uh, we have to try to negotiate another treaty and people are appalled by the treaty that John Jay negotiates in 1784 and um, I think it's passed in 85, the, the Jay Treaty. That was another thing is that, well, we're not even strong enough that the British will take us seriously. It's the, sort of the idea of the world is laughing at us, you know? 
Yeah, the, so the world is laughing at us, but I love that statement that you just made, we're not even strong enough. And so we win the revolution. France is dealing with their own re- beginnings of their own revolution, and that's where Jefferson is. But, and other countries, we can't even get them to leave. We're not even strong enough to say, no, 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 you sign this, now get out. We have nothing to back us. But then we we even have turmoil amongst our own people. So I know what our kids are studying right now. They're all studying Shay's Rebellion. So can you kind of give us a rundown on Shay's Rebellion and how bad that was and how it really kind of gave energy to making people like Madison and Hamilton and Washington come to this convention and take it seriously? Yeah, so Daniel Shays is a former Revolutionary War soldier and he's a farmer in Massachusetts. And... Shays leads a rebellion um, of mostly former soldiers turned farmers. And their principal problem is this problem of debt, this problem of we're not being paid, our bonds aren't being paid out, we have no money, we have no relief. Because what they were really asking for was debt relief, right? That might even sound familiar, but they were asking for legislation. They're saying, look, we need some sort of debt relief. And they're asking the state to do it because they're not even thinking of Congress. They're thinking, well, the state hasn't done enough. They need to do more. So we're going to march on the state capitol and we're going to force them to do more. And um, because there's no real federal army, it's the state militia that ultimately has to put down the rebellion to arrest the leadership and to try them. So the issue is it becomes mostly a state problem, but it really looks like a larger one, right? Because from the standpoint of Washington and Hamilton and others like Henry Knox, and you mentioned Madison, it looks like this is the first of many, right? They look at Shays and they're horrified because they say more and more of these are going to pop up. We're going to have violent turmoil everywhere, and we have no way of stopping it, and we have no way of addressing the underlying issue, right? So it's not just a problem of what do we do about potential insurrection. It's also a problem of we can't even fix the reason why they're doing this because uh, Washington himself had dealt with this issue throughout the time he was general. His men uh, tried to mutiny multiple times and were very frustrated with not getting paid. So Washington knew their struggle, right? So the problem is both, right? It's the sense of without a solution, this violence eventually is going to break up the country right? We're going to have a civil war. And the other is, we can, not only do we not have an army, but we can't even pass legislation to deal with this problem we all know exists. So Nick, real quick, that, that's perfect. So we get to this moment of chaos. They all yeah. come to the Constitutional Convention. They're here from May 25th to September 17th, it's kind of just like a layout. Long, yeah. hot, sweaty Philadelphia summer. We are not known for comfortable summers. Um, and like you said, the windows are closed. It's in secret. We're going to talk about the key compromises, but first really quickly, because we have t- 11 minutes really quickly. Can you run down what they do set up? And then I want to dive into the big compromises and how that works out. So overview, they set up the structural constitution. When most of our students think of most, not just our kids, our adults too. When you think about the constitution, most people's brains go to amendments. They don't always start with that structural constitution. So can you break down what that is? And then we're gonna dive into the key compromises and then spend the the end piece really talking about that three-fifth compromise and the slave trade clause compromise. Yeah, so, and this is worth pointing out again, as we already talked about, Remember, the Articles of Confederation is the main thing they're comparing it to. When we get to our um, discussion of ratification, we'll talk about that theme again, which is that uh, what one of the reasons why people will support the Constitution is they don't like the Articles. So the real question is, how is the Constitution different, right? Well, certainly it aims to create a strong nation, national central government, right? You see that even in the preamble, right, in terms of what are the goals of this constitution, right? Is to be able to provide for the general welfare, for the common defense, right? Those terms are important because we just talked about Shays' Rebellion. The idea there is they can't do those things, right? And that's what a government needs to be able to do, 
Structurally, what's important are things like separation of powers and federalism. We're talking about the division of power, right? That's allocated not only to the three branches, so the legislative, the executive, and the judicial, but then between the federal and state government. That matters because even though people will support going from the articles to the new constitution, they are still concerned with doing too much to take away from the power of state governments. So therefore there needs to be a balance of power between this stronger central government that's being created and the state governments that already exist. Got it. So they set up this balance. I always think about it like, and this is ridiculous. So just everybody bear with me. I think about it like a layered cake and also a Neapolitan ice cream at the same time <laughs> because sure. the two work together. So there's federalism, the idea that there's a national government, state governments and local governments. That's the cake with its layers up and down. And then horizontally, then you have the branching of the three branches and the separation of powers as well as there. And I know our students are learning about that. Article one is Congress. Article two is the presidency. Article three is the judiciary. Now there's also seven, more, seven total articles uh, about how it works. But if we think about it like that, they're not just separating power in this direction between the branches, but across it. So we're now building a constitution that gives federal government power, but it's limited. And so the constitution, Nick, could you say like, it's almost like the rules of the game board. Like, how do we play this game of United States? Here's what yeah. the rules are. Here's whose job it is. And this is how we all have to work together. Is that like a, a good analogy? I mean, I think yours works because it's, we've used like horizontal and vertical. Like, even if you talked about like a company or something like that, right? People use those terms all the time, right? to say it, you can look at it both ways, right? So if it's vertical, we're saying there it's limited, but it has more expanded power. But within there, there's a tension between those two governments, right? The reason you use that metaphor too is to point out these aren't perfect divisions, right? It's not as if like, here's state governments over here and here's the national government over here and they never intersect. If they're part of the same cake, they crumble together too. There's tension. That tension is really important actually because it's not, sometimes they share power. Right, and uh, sometimes the question that the Supreme Court has to answer, for instance, is who dominates, right? Who keeps the power? Even separation of powers is the same thing, right? There's, there's divisions, but then there's also sharing. And that's actually in the design of the system. James Madison did that on purpose. He says this in Federalist 51 famously, right? Is that, well, factions counteract factions, right? And ambition counteracts ambition. Therefore, we want some sharing of powers because that will actually make it harder to do bad things in government, right? So that's, that's actually part of the theory behind the constitution. So this idea of separating power horizontally, vertically, and then yep. creating checks and balances where I love the idea of the cake layers mushing and you're yeah. right, they totally yeah, do. Yeah, just um, stick with the yeah. metaphor, it works. <laughs> I love food, so if we haven't noticed, <laughs> if you've been to any of my other classes, we always talk about food, so a real quick constitutional walk. So the preamble <laughs> is the opening statement of the constitution and it begins with we the people. Next, we have what Nick just went through, article one, two, and three, sets up Congress, the executive, the presidency, and then the third is judiciary, and that's the court. And then article four, five, six, and seven. And all of this is on the interactive constitution as well as on our in the classroom section because you can go through this slower and with your students and with each other and your parents. Um, so really cruising down because we are on five minutes left. We need to really talk about kind of the, what Let's happens Let's just run through the compromises. Yeah, we got five okay, of them. Let's fly just... through... Okay, yeah, real let's quick because I want to say that piece. last one is definitely debates. Oh, let's see. I'm going to make you guys all nauseous. <laughs> debates over the, you want to start with debates over the presidency? Yeah, well, let's just even summarize those because it's just worth pointing out, right, is that we just showed you all those pieces of the Constitution, but not every one of those was debated at length. In fact, Article 3, which deals with the judiciary, was not debated for very long at all, right? It wasn't one of the main issues, and Congress and its powers wasn't either. It is you, we showed in the slides, representation was a big deal. Why? Well, we mentioned these political issues and uh, issues in the 1780s, right? Small states were really mad about how 
large states were treating them. And so when they sent representatives to Philadelphia, what they said is we need to win equal representation for small states, right? We need to maintain our power to have a voice in representative government, right? And so we get to the Con Connecticut Compromise. That's part of the reason that Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth were pushing so hard for compromises because they had to ensure that representation was something they want, right? So representation was a big deal because they had to figure this out, right? What, how does represent, in other words, how does representative government look in a large country or a large republic? The central problem of Federalist 10, that's one of Madison's papers, right? So that's the Connecticut Compromise, which is, we know it is bicameralism, right? The Senate is based on equal representation. All states get two senators and it's proportional in the house, right? It's based on your population. We'll see that that's connected to other issues that we get to. One of those is slavery, right? The three-fifths compromise can be connected to the Connecticut Compromise because it's essentially about how much should slaves count as a proportion of population for representation. That's actually the issue, right? And slave states in the South, especially South Carolina and Georgia, wanted slaves to count as equal persons, right? And of course, Northern representatives, some of them who were strongly anti-slavery said, it's absurd. That includes Governor Morris, our friend from New York who was representing Pennsylvania, because how could you say they're not a human being by making them a slave, yet want them to be counted for representation? The three-fifths uh, ratio actually comes from a proposal in 1784. And in that proposal, the sides were flipped. The North said, for uh, for taxes, let's count them as whole persons because you want to pretend that you can make human beings property and then so therefore you should be taxed under them and the South said no, we shouldn't be taxed at all for them. Um, it's just they, you know, so that's actually where it got taken from. So it was an existing uh, formula that they, they used as a means of compromise um, because it was roughly in the middle, right, because the South at least South Carolina said that they would leave at some points the convention if they didn't get some form of representation in their uh, their slaves, right? Uh, the electoral so, college. Oh, sorry. Can sorry. we just pause on those two? Because sure, sure. And I know I sent in the chat box earlier that November 9th, the week of November 9th, we're going to be spending the entire week talking about slavery in the Constitution. So we can really unpack that. But I wanted to pause for a minute and look at these things. So when we, we talk about slavery in America, we talk about the three-fifths compromise, we talk about the slave trade clause, these pieces that are in the constitution that embed slavery into our constitution and therefore enslave people longer. So I just wanted to pause for a minute for the students because I know that's a lot to grapple with and unpack. And these the, people like Governor Morris, and I'm gonna stop share for a minute to make sure you can see, people like Governor Morris, this guy right here, he speaks out and says, this is wrong, this is wrong. And Nick talked about that. But we just had a declaration of independence that told the world that all men are created equal. And then not too long later, we're writing a constitution that has clauses in it that embed slavery into the constitution. So I just wanted to pause for a minute and ask anybody if you had questions around that. I know it's a lot really quick and we're gonna dive into it deeper, but it's definitely a hard part of our history uh, and a difficult part to understand fully. So we wanted to give a minute and then we'll go into electoral college, another hard part of our constitution to understand. This one's a little bit more emotionally hard as well as understandably hard. Um, you guys seem like you're good listeners, but really quiet in the chat box today. So just if you have any questions, put them in the chat box and we'll grab them towards the end. But Nick, in the bottom of the ninth, we have about a couple minutes left. We always can run a little bit over. This is typically a half an hour. Let's talk really quickly about that electoral college as the kids kind of process through their questions. Yeah, and let me just say that part of that compromise too, and Madison is part of this, is that the word slave never appears in the Constitution and that's on purpose. So as Madison famously said, no property in man can be admitted to the Constitution. So that is also part of the compromise is while they would accept um, some parts of the Constitution that would be based on property according to state law, right? In other words, if states made slavery part of their laws or their constitution, um, 
but it would not embed it into the text in terms of actually recognizing slaves. So like, for instance, the Fugitive Slave Clause, which we'll talk about when we do that whole lecture, um, shows this, right? Because it doesn't actually refer to slave, but uses other language, right? So that's actually part of the compromise as well. Uh, the Electoral College, um, I, you know, I, I think it's worth pointing out that um, it's act, there, there's actually scholarly debate about whether or not that is in fact connected to slavery or not. Uh, the reason for that is uh, it's, it is connected a little bit to representation, but it's mostly debate over the president and how the president should be selected, right? And this is really hard. I, I know we talked about this a little bit last week, but there are so many different plans that are thrown out. No one knows what the best idea is. Part of the reason for that is there are strong advocates on very different sides, right? There are people like James Wilson who want direct um, representation, right? They want the people to directly elect the president. Um, and then there's people on the other hand who would prefer Congress. And it's the Southern states, the slave states who actually want Congress to do so. Now you can see a little bit about their rationale because if they got the, what they wanted representation, if slaves counted for a full person, then they would have actually more political control to also choose the president. It would ensure a certain amount of political control. And so you can see that there's that political aspect of, of it going on as well. Um, and then there's people who had other ideas, right? Congress shouldn't pick because that would be corrupt, but the people can be swayed by essentially what they thought of being like populist candidates, right? Um, demagogues is what they called them. So they prefer things like having maybe the state governors pick, right? Or in this case, James Wilson's idea, the electoral college, right? This came from a idea of if we could get the best, most virtuous people, right? Who could truly represent everybody, right? The interests of the country, not themselves. So that's what we mean by disinterestedness, right? To be virtuous is to not be self-interested, but by, be guided by the interests of everybody. Could better select the president, right? Um, so that's my best way of trying to distill the electoral college, right? That's that's kind of where it comes from. Is they're they're running out of time as we are. They have a lot of different uh, potential plans on the table, and they 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 go with this one, right? Um, and then the last piece is the slave trade, and I think uh, just to start off with, this is another one of the uh, debates that almost has South Carolina leaving. Um, because despite the compromises that they got, they were still, some of them, upset. Um, they were upset that the slave trade could even end at some point, that anyone wanted to do it. And they thought that Virginians were hypocrites who weren't really interested in human, humane concerns, uh, but their own economic self-interest by defeating the lower Southern states. But what is the big trade uh, uh, debate is whether or not Congress will have power to end the slave trade. And the slave trade, at least for some of the Virginians who owned slaves like George Mason, uh, they were very, very against the slave trade because for them, and this may be hard to understand in 2020, um, they saw the slave trade itself as being more obviously inhumane, right? because the very passage and the taking of people was more obviously immoral. And therefore that's what needed to end. Uh, Jefferson famously drafted a piece, a portion of the Declaration of Independence that was going to address this. South Carolina demanded then in 1776 that that language be removed. They're the constant irritant here, right? Um, and with the slave trade, what's the compromise? Well, Congress will have power to end the slave trade, but they won't have it for 20 years. And of course, the problem there, as many people recognize, critics recognize, is that gave 20 years for South Carolina and others to ramp up, uh, to bring over more slaves before the end of the slave trade. The slave trade does end. On January 1st, 1808, the first day it can end, it ends. But there's still that 20 years. And from there, as we'll talk about when we get to it, we transition um, away from the Atlantic slave trade to an internal slave trade. So part of the problem was, uh, it turns out that there was enough enslaved people in the United States as a population that now there, there could be an internal trade. And that was something that those who compromised, I think, at least I would say, 
didn't entirely foresee because their hope at the time was enough states in the North were beginning to move towards abolition or emancipation that eventually slavery would die. And that 20 years was a marking of their idea of the possible eventual death of this thing. It might take a generation or two. And they didn't perceive, I think, some of those uh, unintended or perhaps even uh, foreseeable consequences of this particular compromise. And, it, and I think that's really important because I know this is a debate that a lot of people are having in our con uh, country about what were they thinking? Did they know it was wrong? And we're gonna dive into that in even more detail the week of November 9th. So please come back because that is just a really difficult conversation to have. We can look at our constitution and see brilliance and awfulness at the same time and say, what did we do well? What did we do wrong? But I think what Nick is trying to show is like, not all the time did they understand the impact and then sometimes they did and what kind of power it gave to the slave holding states. So there's a lot to unpack there and there's a lot of compromises that happen. And what I think the big ideas that I try to remember on this constitution week is they set up a government that brought us together as a country that gave, gave power to a federal government to move us forward, but at the same time was limited power. And then there were just choices and compromises they, they made that we need to understand what happened back then, 233 years ago, and how it affects us today. One question that came in from the chat box that I think is a great question from Jesse. Um, I think it's an awesome question because as a Philadelphian, I always get annoyed by this. Why did they move the Capitol to DC? <laughs> Real good, like, I love these questions. Why the yeah. heck did they ever move it? It was in Philly, it was in New York, but why did it wind up in DC? Uh, and then well, we'll wrap up, guys. Frankly, it, you know, to tell the short story is another compromise. Um, those who have seen <laughs> Hamilton are probably familiar with the famous dinner and Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson's uh, New York uh, boarding house or uh, something that he had, he had his room between Hamilton and Madison. And what it came out of is Hamilton was trying to pass a bill as part of his financial plan for state debt relief. So, hey, we're talking about that again. And his plan was to have the federal government take over all of it. The thing is, that would benefit all those speculators I talked about. They are going to get rich. And there was a lot of people who were upset about this. Madison and uh, Jefferson and others were among them, right? And so the compromise they came up with is Hamilton said, uh, Madison said, look, I won't object. I'll let your bill pass. But here's what the Southern states want. They want to move the capital in towards the South, right? They want the seat of the government to be within the South. Washington, D.C. was basically right in the middle of Charleston, South Carolina, geographically, in New York City. It is therefore this piece of swampland near Mount Vernon was chosen to be the seat of government. Um, and so that's, that's really the reason. Um, in Philadelphia, um, it, it was temporarily the capital. People were happy to leave after the yellow fever epidemic. Um, uh, you know, but the reason was there was a political compromise because people were mad about Hamilton's financial plan. And therefore, in order to accept it, when the votes got very close, so I think it was like 51 to 48 or something like that, this is the thing that they got in exchange. Making deals and seeing how they affect us so today. This is about <laughs> making deals. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nick. It was a great talk. I hope you guys had a lot of fun. If you have any questions afterwards, you can feel free to join us at 2. Or on Wednesday, we're doing a 12 o'clock session for middle school level again. Great to have you. It's going to be an awesome week. On Thursday, Neil Gorsuch is going to join us, uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch. So we have a, and then Alexis Coe on Friday. So we have a banner constitution week coming up. Hope to see you guys again. If you need anything, email us and let us know. And next week, we are doing ratification debates, right, Nick? Yes. Roll them to the Constitution, people. <laughs> Thank you, guys. If you need anything, just let us know. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.